one, we're live. Welcome. Uh, we're delighted to come together for the uh, Latin America panel uh, for this really fantastic conference on investing in sustainable forestry and regenerative agriculture. It's a real honor for me. My name is Sean Paul. I'm the CEO of Ejido Verde, a uh, Mexican pine resin supply company, uh, where I'm joining the conference from uh, my home in Morelia, Michoacan. And I'm really, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to be joined on this panel by such a distinguished uh, group of uh, panelists who really, I think we're all involved in some very exciting respect efforts respectively um, in the region. I'm really looking forward to the audience um, getting a sense of some of the exciting investment activities and opportunities available in Latin America. And I just wanna make a point that we will be used responding uh, to questions that the audience might pose. So please uh, put your questions or comments in, in, in the chat and we'll, we'll be sure to get to those comments. Um, by way of introduction, I'm, I'm gonna really ask, I'm gonna start with myself and then go um, through the group here uh, to just uh, with some introductions of who we are and what we're doing. And uh, to begin with, as I mentioned, my name is Sean Paul and the CEO of Ajito Verde a Mexican pine resin supply company that's focused on the state of Michoacan, Mexico. Uh, we're in the process of uh, restoring degraded lands. Um, we've now restored uh, 4,000 hectares toward our goal of 12,000 hectares of, of establishing commercial agroforestry plantations with the primary purpose of uh, providing um, pine resin to the pine chemical industry. I come to this work with uh, 30 years of uh, professional experience working in uh, social finance uh, to improve sustainable rural livelihoods and the conservation of nature. Uh, that means uh, philanthropy, um, debt and equity uh, around the, those purposes. If I could perhaps ask Fernando uh, to follow with an introduction. Oh, sure. Thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Fernando. I manage a family office from Brazil. Uh, the family office is called Progresso, but I created a company in the Netherlands called Meraki Impact. And this takes care of what we call the deep impact uh, portfolio, part of a portfolio. And this is mostly geared to regenerative agriculture, uh, soil, and everything we're looking at is how can we curve down deforestation and how can we regenerate what was lost of our forests uh, using other, other means of agriculture, regenerative agriculture. So one important pillar of the, our investments that I'm going to talk about here, it's really uh, the farm projects we have in Brazil. There are like two main ones, but we also do Brazilian impact funds and we do European uh, technology, uh, VC tech funds that have potential to, to help us scale this uh, regen ag space. Yeah, so in the nutshell, this is what, it, what we do. Sean, you're, you're on mute. Uh, Johnny, can I ask you to uh, follow? Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Uh, thanks very much, Sean, and very nice to be part of uh, this panel and uh, this uh, uh, event. So thanks to Warren as well. <laughs> I'm Johnny Brum from, uh, I'm the founder of Sale Ventures. We're a, a boutique investment firm uh, headquartered out of The Hague in the Netherlands, but also with uh, investment leads in Singapore and Sao Paulo. Um, of the fund we manage is the Ang Green Fund. Um, you know, in one sentence, Ang Green, we're focused on the tropics uh, and financing the transition of major, major um, commodity supply chains away from deforestation. So, you know, we're really looking at the supply chains like cattle in Brazil, um, soy, palm oil in Indonesia, um, et cetera, and looking to finance a new business model um, towards sustainability and, and definitely zero deforestation. So. The fund at the moment, we've raised about 150 million. Uh, we've deployed to just under 100. So that's sort of where we are. We're still early, early stage for, for where we're going. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Alan, could you please follow? Thank you. Thanks, Sean, for, for the introduction. Uh, quite happy to be here. Uh, I know all the, the panelists have worked with or have met in previous conferences before, so it was quite good to be here. Uh, I am a Brazilian. Uh, I, I work at Mirova Natural Capital, 
based on our office uh, from Sao Paulo. Uh, we, I, I have a forest, forestry background. Uh, I have worked in the pulp and paper sector. Uh, I have worked with actually Miguel at Dabrai uh, before. Uh, so I come from this uh, background in forestry. Uh, currently, uh, I'm dedicated uh, to the ABF fund, which is the Amazon Biodiversity Fund, who, uh, which was recently uh, launched um, between 2019, just the beginning of 2020. Uh, it's a fund uh, focused in, in biodiversity uh, in the Amazon. So uh, Mirova Natural Capital has a, a, a track record of investing in, in nature-based solutions for, for eight years. It's a, it's a platform that invests in natural capital uh, globally. Uh, we've been in Brazil for five years uh, now. Uh, one of our first investments were um, in, in, in cattle, sustainable cattle uh, production in the, in the Amazon, the state of, of Mato Grosso. And now uh, with, the, with the launch of the ABF fund, we have uh, done two investments by the, the end of the year, uh, 2020, uh, that I will talk a little bit more uh, about in the, in, the coming, in the coming session. Uh, but basically, we, we are really focused on, on uh, scaling up sustainable enterprises in the, in the Amazonia Legal of Brazil. Uh, so in businesses that really have potential to scale up, we focused um, on instruments such as, you know, equity, debt, quasi-equity instruments. I, I will also talk a little bit more about of those instruments here. Um, yeah, and happy to answer uh, any, any questions uh, from the audience as well. Thank you, Sean. Great, Alan. Miguel, would you? Yes, oh. yes. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Sean, for introducing our panel. And again, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here in this panel with so many experts and investors. So I'm not the investor, but I am the one trying to make the business case for investors. So I work for WRI Brazil. Uh, so in Brazil, I'm also a Brazilian. And what I would like to share here with you is really what we have learned through the Verena project to demonstrate the economic viability in investing in civil culture of native species and agroforest systems. So we have a lot of lessons to learn from the work we have been doing with uh, in, through the Verena in Brazil. Alan, he was a, a very important uh, uh, team player of the Verena. We started this together. So I think there's a lot of lessons learned that we can share here and how we can even uh, demonstrate some of the ways that we have been using to mitigate some of the risks to attract private investors in civil culture of native species and agroforest, but also to attract farmers. So again, Brazil has a huge potential as the whole Latin America. And so I really look forward to seeing a very productive discussion here in this panel. Thank you very much. Miguel, I'm wondering if I could just follow up on that. I'm, I'm interested in hearing from the panelists a little bit about your investment thesis and any particular deal that you're involved with that you're especially excited about. <laughs> And I would like to ask you first, Miguel, can you give a sense of where you are in this project? What's the deal size? What's the ticket size investment? What's the scale of the project uh, that, that, that you're, you're building? Yeah, again, let me just start saying that, for example, in the case of Brazil, right, we have a good uh, hand about what's happening in Brazil. And again, just to start, we have uh, maybe around 50 million hectares of degraded pasture lands with low suitability for agriculture that can really benefits from civil culture native species and agroforestry without competing with food production, fiber production, so on. So what we have been doing during the last uh, uh, five years, really trying to see where are the hotspots to really attract private investments and also to engage farmers, because most of the lands that we have been working uh, in Brazil, they belong to private landowners. So if we are not able to make the case for those private landowners to really invest on civil culture native species and agroforest systems, then we will never get to the scale that we need to get, because uh, at the end of the day, we want to at least use part of our work to contribute to Brazil's targets to restore and reforest 12 million hectares of degraded land. So we have been, again, working in mainly in three biomes, the Amazon, Atlantic Forest, and the Cerrados, and try to identify, first of all, we started uh, looking into the, at the project level. Can we have a real business at the project level? And of course, the answer we came up was yes, you get really a very good uh, return on investment, especially when you compare with uh, 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 traditional agriculture or even with uh, traditional plantations with pine and eucalyptus. So it's a real business to produce timber and non-timber products from civil culture and species and, 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 and agroforestry. But uh, on the, so even though there's a huge opportunity in terms of return of investments, 
but also there are some uh, challenges because uh, as we all know, the payback is longer and the need of capital is, 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 is significant. So I think our challenge is how we can really mobilize those investments and also we can also reduce the, the return on investment, the, 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 the payback. And of course, we found many ways we can do that. And of course, as many other kind of uh, economic activity, there's a need, for example, to invest on research and development. So the same way we have been very successful in planting pine and eucalypts and other commodities, for example, in native species, we can do the same. But of course, we don't need to wait a very long time as, as what happened with the forest sector with uh, eucalypts and pine, because we already have some solution. We can regenerate result on the short term. We also need to invest a lot of the, on, on policy and incentive because again, if you're talking about big scale, especially if we want to make this attractive to investors, we want to have a good environment for those investors and for the landowners. So if they invest on something that's a longer term, they, they want to be sure to get the returns on this longer term investment. So again, we have been working a lot on how really to make this more, let's say, attractive to the investors and to the, and to the landowners and also, it is very important since we really want to make this a real business for Brazil to really be, let, let's say, a global leader on timber production, for example, we need to take a good look on the market side, right? We're talking about medium and long-term markets. So how we can ensure, especially for the investor that they invest on long-term, that whatever we are producing now, we really have that value in the future to ensure that the investor will get their return, not only the investor, but also the landowner that we invest on this type of activity. So, Again, we are talking about, again, we started looking into the project level approach. In fact, we are helping some of those project level, let's say investments to expand their operation. But right now we are working much more in looking into landscapes. Again, what are the hotspots that can really, we can uh, attract several investors to that particular landscape. So we're talking about big territories and in some of those territories, we are talking about a couple million hectares. They could be they are available for investments. So the question is, how we can match what we can deliver from the supply to the demand from those investors. I think what, what was we learned is that we need more and more to work together with the investor to make sure that we design what the investors are looking for. And I think we are in a very position to do that because we learned so much over the last five years that I think we are ready to really point to whatever the investment you're interested in. If you're interested on cocoa agroforestry, yeah, we know where you can really have a good return and we can point to that particular region, we can design some of the projects to really make this align to the, to the, to the investor, work on the investment thesis with the investor to ensure that at the end of the day, everybody will benefit. So I start from here, Sean, and again, I would be more than happy to keep answering uh, questions. Thank you very much. Uh, inter interesting uh, presentation that just raises a lot of more questions of wanting to know more. And I just, one of the questions, I just a follow on question, I, I really liked Alan's uh, observation in the chat. Could you share with us what, what makes cattle investment sustainable from your perspective? Uh, hi, Sean. Uh, thanks for, for the question. Uh, it's really about uh, how we uh, integrate uh, the, supply, the supply chain on cattle production. So from uh, the production from the, the calves, uh, the fattening process, and especially uh, the way we can uh, intensify the production of, of, of pastures. So it's really about uh, mitigating and monitoring the, the, the source, the sourcing of the, the, the calves, because um, when you, when you I mean, basically in Brazil, you have, for example, three, uh, the three large meat packers, they are listed companies uh, and, and global integrated. The fattening process, it's, it's pretty much um, uh, straightforward, it's very understood, it's uh, easily monitored. But the problem is how you source uh, your, your calves. Uh, so th that's uh, the company, that's one of our funds have uh, a stake in it. Uh, it's called Paxa. Uh, uh, they, they really have like the, the partners where they operate with partnering uh, with the ca calf production. So you can really ensure that there's no uh, deforestation attached to, the, to this uh, production. And together with that, uh, we, uh, they also have a large investment in intensify the production of, of pasture. So you can actually uh, have a balance uh, of carbon that we also measure that it's actually a, a, a net zero 
uh, production of, of carbon in terms of this uh, meat production. Uh, it, it's really interesting. I, mean, uh, I can actually, I can post later the, the, the report uh, on PAXA here in the chat. So if anyone wants to, to take a look on the, on the monitoring report, I think it's really, it, it's really interesting. It's a very interesting example of cattle production uh, in the Brazilian Amazon. Okay, so Alan, hey, could I... if I could follow up, Alan, um, what, mm -hmm. so in your, the fund you're working with on Brazil, like what's the ticket size you're looking for? Um, can you give a, an example of an, an investment you've made that you're especially excited about? Oh, yep, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so, um, so the, the, the example I just mentioned, it's from a, another fund. So the fund we are deploying here in Brazil, uh, the, the ABF fund, we are in a, on a second uh, fundraising for the fund. We have closed the first one uh, in 2020. So currently the size of the fund is 62 million reais. And we are growing to, to close 300 million reais. Uh, so basically today we, we have a, a venture window of investment uh, in, in companies. And with the second closing, we're gonna do uh, some early, early growth uh, investments. Uh, uh, in the in the Amazon. So uh, basically, today we're looking from anything from uh, more or less three million to, to nine million highs. So basically, five hundred thousand uh, US dollars, more or less, to uh, two million uh, US dollars today, with a follow-on option. So we always uh, uh, put a follow-on option because we are still fundraising and 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 growing the fund. Uh, which what is interesting about it is that uh, has a, a, a double locking risk mitigation, uh, especially in the debt portfolio of the of the fund. So the first investor uh, was uh, SIAT, the the Center for International Tropical Agriculture, uh, from an investment from the USAID uh, multilateral agency. So they have the so they provide the 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 risk guarantee. And for the for the private investors uh, coming in this in this second phase uh, now, so this is really interesting because it provides some ability for uh, for different uh, investment uh, uh, instruments. So uh, we don't have to do only uh, plain vanilla debt or common equity. We we often use uh, quasi equity instruments, self liquidating instruments, because usually that's the that's key, right? I mean, uh, we have an investment phase now, but we, we're going to face a, a, a divestment phase uh, afterwards, which is usually a big challenge for for funds. And maybe our colleagues, especially Fernando and Johnny, can can comment on that as well, because that's usually the 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 key uh, challenge for for impact funds. Um, uh, on, on the last part of the the question, I think. Uh, Two investments we were really proud to to make uh, uh, to, to do uh, was last year. Uh, it was a very challenging environment for us, especially with COVID here uh, uh, in Brazil and especially in the Amazon. Uh, but we managed to to invest in two uh, companies that actually uh, provide uh, food and beverage uh, products from Amazonian uh, ingredients, so Amazonian plants. Uh, one, um, uh, it's in an early growth uh, stage. It's called Manioca, uh, that provides uh, ingredients for for restaurants and uh, retailers uh, here in Brazil. Uh, and the other one, it's Horta da Terra, that has a, a regenerative uh, production of uh, uh, banks uh, in Brazil, so non-traditional edible plants from from the Amazon. And it's a vertically integrated company. So uh, they produce from seedlings uh, to freeze dried products, which is, uh, uh, it's very key for uh, aggregating value in, the, in, in such a place in the Amazon. And it's key as well uh, to deal with some uh, lack of infrastructure uh, we have there uh, in the region. So it's very different uh, logistics to, pro to supply uh, fresh products and freeze dry products, for example. So. Uh, so that company, it's in a um, venture stage, so it's much more like a startup, whereas Manioca, it's more in a early growth as it's a company 
that's uh, uh, have steady revenues already. So it's really about scaling up uh, that investment. Thank you, Alan. I've been certainly impressed with Marova. It really seems to be scaling nature-based uh, uh, solutions and brought a number of funds and certainly extremely exciting to hear what you're ramping up in Brazil. Fernando, I'd like to turn to you. I, I'm particularly intrigued with your kind of operator background uh, and also deploying capital. So I'd really love to hear kind of what are you most excited about in your investment practice? Um, and kind of an example of, you know, of what you're most excited about. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we are a family office, so we have a little bit more flexibility. You know, I don't have the pain of the funds of having to divest in 10 years, 12 years. Uh, so I'm involved in two large farm projects and, and with our colleagues in the panel, in a way, too. So like I'm looking, one of them is more early stage, is also around cattle. So PEXA that uh, uh, like Alan mentioned is, a, is an inspiration for us. And, and this is like, we, we see it as the future of protein. So we have the calves integrated to an agroforestry system, uh, mainly with nut trees. We're planting cashew and baru, which is a native species from the Cerrado region, where we are in Mato Grosso, close to the border with Bolivia. And we're also tapping out this to a supply chain that was basically built by IDH in the state, where in the, the edge of the supply chain, you have retailers that are starting to launch uh, beef with uh, kind of a sustainable label, so to say. You know? But for us, the most exciting thing in this project is the alternative proteins we're planting. Uh, so the nuts, the grains in between the, the tree lines. And this is where our cattle is going to go. And as we do that, we can intensify the number of, uh, of animals per hectare. So this is how we, we do it. And then the other project is later stage. I'm a minority investor. Uh, my partners started this eight years ago. It's called Symbiosis. It was also part of the Verena uh, that Miguel was talking about. Pasto Vivo, the early stage one, we're hoping to, to get on the Verena platform very soon too. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about Symbiosis is moving to year nine, and this is a pure timber play. So it's an agroforestry system. We have uh, native species from the Atlantic forest of uh, Brazil. And then we have six or seven of them that we're looking to, to make it commercially. And it's really beautiful to see in year nine how the system is really working and how nature starts really helping us to, to, to scale this. Uh, so this is a project that my partners, they, they got up to 1,200 hectares and now we're pushing to 5,000 hectares. Uh, so, it, so it's an interesting way of seeing it. But the key thing of these two projects, we have cash flows for 36 years on our, on our cash flow projections. On the first one, we start getting very interesting returns, very strong returns per hectare. We're talking about 16% IRR, but we have to get there. So the first six years are very painful, a lot of investment. I have the team right now in Mato Grosso planting the trees, like uh, the first uh, hectares. And, and it's, and it's going to take time and it takes different type of financing to, to be able to tackle this type of project. So I think that's the key. And when we talk about the pure timber one, then it's even further out, the cash flow. So, so I think that the, uh, the long-term perspective is, is the key, is the, is the main issue here. And we have to be very... Uh, creative in the financial vehicles we do to be able to use finance for this for this project. Terrific, Fernando. And Johnny, as I, as I frame, uh, frame uh, the question for you, building on Fernando's comment, um, at Ajito Verde, we face a classic challenge that Fernando mentioned. We're planting millions of trees, but it takes, for us, in our case, it takes 10 years until we start seeing re re you know, revenue that we source from the resin tap from the pine trees we plant. But that gap on the early end, um, in terms of uh, forestry projects that don't have the early revenue, I'd be very interested to hear how, how you're managing that issue or avoiding that issue um, in the exciting work you're doing, really in building and scaling and green. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sean. And uh, um, no, it's good to hear so many people talk about cattle as well, by the way, because in many, in many, in many places and, and panels, that's but to do. Um, but I guess there's four of us very interested in Brazil, so that makes sense. Um, just in terms of how we look at investments, I mean, number one, when this fund was set up and the Norwegian government was our anchor, 
the point of the fund is to protect uh, and restore natural forest. So that, that's sort of the overarching impact is natural forest. Our approach to it is to finance production, which sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but essentially what we're looking at globally, we say, where is there relevant forest to protect? You know, it takes you to the Borneo forest, it takes you to the Amazon, it takes you to the Congo basin um, and other areas as well, like Liberia, you know, there's other places as well. Um, the second question is what is putting pressure on that forest, which supply chain? And then we look at investing either in that supply chain, like cattle in Brazil, for example, or in an alternative business model that can transition or can remove that stressor on the forest um, in the landscape in which we look at. But very important for us is we want to see active protection as well, because you know sometimes that, that thesis can become stretched and stretched and stretched and you end up financing things which you know, are great, but are really far removed from actual forest protection. So just to give you perspective on how we look at the world, that takes us to Brazil, Indonesia, Colombia, um, uh, and many other countries because of that thesis. Uh, we've started off with a main focus on, to be honest, on Brazil and Indonesia. And I'll, I'll talk mainly about LATAM now. Um, so Brazil, at the moment in our portfolio, our exposure in LATAM is very much Brazil. Um, we're hoping to close a Colombian transaction this year. Um, we're also looking at Ecuador and Peru and a, and a few other countries. Sure, Mexico is also interesting for us. Um, you, the way we've set up this fund, I mean, you're financing agriculture um, or you know, agriculture, forestry or cattle. Um, we're trying to finance a change in business model or a new business model. So to your point, Sean, you can't do that with short term working capital or, or anything like that. You need to be able to be patient. Um, and the advantage of that is also on the environmental and social side, so also in terms of social inclusion, the longer you're in the deal as an investor, the more that kind of change can happen as well, right? In terms of you can see protection over many years is much better than a you know, short term loan doesn't really give you comfort that an asset will be protected. Same with social inclusion. It's a long term process. Um, so to answer you know, your comment, uh, what we've done is we've raised very long term patient capital. We're actually evergreen, Alan, so we also don't quite have the same uh, refinancing issue, but uh, We've raised a lot of permanent capital from our initial investors and only once we get, you know, we're at 150 million now, we've, we've our first development bank has, uh, FMO has financed us recently and we'll slowly start moving now towards the institutional investor bucket. But we've started off with very sort of long-term patient capital to allow us to be look, to look at projects like you mentioned, Sean, um, where we can invest early, you know, backdate our principal, look at how we can structure our cash flows. I think Alan mentioned that as well, to fit to the underlying innovation we're looking to finance. I think that's really important. I mean, and Green is looking at what we would say thematically at market transformation. In other words, we are looking for projects which can be leaders in the industry and can be scaled and replicated. So that typically takes us to larger projects in certain landscapes. So in Brazil, uh, the two transactions we've done actually link a bit back to what's been spoken about. The one is the Roncador. It's a, as a single contiguous farm, it's one of the largest in the world. It's about 150,000 hectares. Um, half of it is forest, the rest of it is a combination of cattle um, and degraded land. And what we're doing there is they'll move that full half the farm, so 65,000 hectares, into a cattle and soy integration play, ICL, as we call it in Brazil, which is interesting because it's been going to be done at scale. And from a carbon, you know, talking about regenerative agriculture, the, the impact on the farm can be quite significant. So they can double their herd and half their emissions, which is an interesting, interesting play. And I think importantly for us, you know, we look at it from a landscape perspective. So we want our clients always to have an impact beyond just the farm. In this case, um, <clears throat> Roncador, part of our agreement with them and financing them is also um, bringing in smaller farmers in the region to you know, show them how they're doing their, their investment, what, what it takes, the economics of it, um, the environmental and social safeguarding. All of that training is sort of part of our, of our investment. We, Essentially, we're offering long-term debt. We don't do equity. Um, also, because some of our we're looking with some larger clients, we don't think the equity is always the right tool. And maybe just very briefly, Sean, the second transaction is kind of links back to Alan's point. Uh, we're actually financing one of those three large meat packers, um, specifically on what Alan spoke about, which is about sustainability in the cattle space in Brazil. Is you know, a crop cannot walk. So when you look at soy, you look at that farm. But the problem with cattle is. By the time it gets to the slaughterhouse, it might have moved through three or four or five or six farms. And if you want to be zero deforestation, you have to track that cow from day one. Um, and that's often the problem, right? They're sort of whitewashing because the final farm selling to the slaughterhouse is zero deforestation. But tier two, tier three, et cetera, 
uh, is deforesting. So that, that's sort of what we're doing with the larger meat pack at Mafruk, is we're actually going right down through the supply chain to their 90,000 suppliers and figuring out, you know, how do we address at each level uh, deforestation at the end of the supply chain. I'll, I'll leave it at I, mean, I, have to, I have to say, I find it very provocative with your fund mandate to preserve natural forests, you've gotten into uh, financing meatpacking, which I think really speaks to the practical reality of uh, what, what, you know, practical reality, what we need to be building for these make today solutions in terms of regenerative and sustainable uh, land use practices. Uh, Miguel, I'd like to just turn back, turn back to you and could you share a little more as you, you've been working on this, clearly World Resources Institute has really has a stellar track record bringing together private sector, government, civil society, on really making these shifts in the market um, and really well positioned to really facilitate these natural capital solutions. And I'm wondering now that you've been working on these efforts in such a, an important and challenging part of the world, wh what are the opportunities you see now for investors? Can you give an example of a project or an investment instrument that you really see, um, it, clearly you have this ability to bring essential players together. I'd love to hear more. Sure, yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a really great question. Uh, kind of recently, we helped one, uh, one investors, uh, in fact, one company to expand their operation. They had like uh, 2,000 hectares. They're looking to how to get to 30,000 hectares. So what we did, we identified again 10 landscapes or territories in Brazil based on several uh, uh, knowledge uh, and science data. We were able to already identify which regions would be most suitable for this kind of investment. So you can choose any crop if you want, could be cocoa, could be whatever the crop, right? So once you understand what are the best areas for this kind of investments, then you need to conduct a lot of those socioeconomic studies, policy studies to understand if there, if you have incentives for this kind of product over there. Uh, you also see some of the regulatory framework to see if this is a really kind of a, a, a good environment for the investors and for, and, and for the farmers. You do a lot of market studies to ensure that you have a good market. Again, could be national, international, and so on. And uh, so based on that information, you are able to almost ensure that if you want to really invest on this particular product, could be, again, could be for timber production, could be uh, for oil production, could be for, anyway, for cocoa production. Then you just need to land on those regions and really try, start to really doing more like a, 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 a finer assessment. So what I'm saying that, Right now, even in those 10 territories that, again, the total area of those 10 territories, I think was around like uh, 36 million hectares and 5 million hectares of those 36 million hectares, they were, again, covered by degraded pasture lands is low suitable for agriculture that they could benefit from any kind of uh, civil culture, native species and agroforest. So what we discovered is that in most of the lands, if you look for a, a product that you want to integrate with a pasture land, for example, which is a nice model, right? Again, trees on pasture lands are good for the cattle, right? They can bring more like a, a, a comfort to the animals, they increase resistance of the season, the whole microclimate and generate timber or non-timber products and also have to mitigate climate change that again, uh, our colleagues already mentioned here, again, with this new wave of the carbon market, there's a huge opportunity either to generate carbon offsets, but even to neutralize whatever the emission of the supply chain. If you're talking about beef, and cattle, how we can reduce the emission for that particular product so on. So once, once you do that, again, you, you, you very soon you realize that there's so much land. So for me, the opportunity, for example, talking about, again, Brazil, is that you have a lot of lands. You already have a lot of the models already designed for those lands that you need maybe to combine to really come up with the best model to fit the need of the investors or the farmers. Because again, if you're trying to convince a farmer, don't come with a product ready to to sell to the farmer. You want to understand what the farmers are more kind of uh, likely to produce, to plant, what they are already used to do that stuff. Then you design that, that model with, with them. But still, we already have a good models for a lot of those lands. And I think a good opportunity also that we have been seeing the last few months, for example, we have this low carbon agriculture plan in Brazil, right? They have a, a very big goal again to mitigate climate change, to adapt to climate change and so on. And they have this integrated crop, livestock, and forest systems. So what, and, and again, right now, I think they have already 17 million hectares of those integrated systems. Their goal by 2030 is to have 35 million hectares, to double the amount. So we're talking about a big scale. What we are trying to do with them is that most of those integrated systems, the forest piece is about 
eucalyptus or not exotic species. So we want to show that by putting native species in those systems can generate more income to the farmers, even for longer term, but you can certainly improve the whole uh, cash flow model of that particular business. And also by bringing native species, you again, you have a big impact, much bigger impact on climate change. You have a big impact on biodiversity conservation. You have a big impact on increasing resistance of the system. You reduce service of wind breaks. So again, you, I think we need to be smarter on how we can plug our business within some of the existing policies. They already have a big goal to expand, to double, but also they can bring some public, public finance, not only public finance, but also bring finance from the banks. So I think this also capacity to really blend the finance from finance institutions, from private investors, and maybe some public finance, who knows, right? Sometimes you may get can be a good incentive for that particular model that you are trying to implement. So this can this make this more attractive. And another thing that we, 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 we started this year is that we launched this uh, a new R&D program for native species. So we have a program, we have read some potential funders. So I think once you have a program behind your business, you give much more confidence to the investors that we have someone here taking care of improving the native species, how they can produce more, how can produce better, higher quality of the timber, use better technology and better management. So if you can develop this together in parallel, you give a lot of confidence that you have a long-term program that you really kind of improve more and more what you're trying to do. So I think we, we again, it's like a, a sometimes we, when we think about Brazil, in people's mind, they think about all the deforestation, right? But again, I, I, we like to tell people that again, deforestation is very bad, but again, look at the other side of the coin, the opportunity to convert some of those degraded lands they were deforested many years ago. As I mentioned, we have more than 50 million hectares. How you can convert them to more productive lands? And I think this is where I see the opportunity because as far as we know, degradation is bad for the society anyway. So here we have a need, investor look for this type of, of, of projects. We have uh, uh, the carbon, the new carbon wave coming ahead of us. They look for big projects. They're not going to look for small projects anymore. So we need to be very, uh, uh, we need to be ready to prepare the portfolio for all this kind of finance coming toward us. On muting, oh, sir. Uh, just to continue with this theme of opportunities, I want to go, turn back to Fernando. And I heard uh, in some of the things you've shared, Fernando, pursuing perennial crops, you're investing in perennial crops, nut crops, for example, and technology as its application uh, to sustainable forestry. In my view, those are two segments around sustainable forestry that seem to offer an alpha or above market commercial return. And I'm just uh, wondering how much that thinking is uh, informing your, your investment decisions and uh, capital deployment. Uh, yes, for sure, Sean. Like, I really believe in nuts as a kind of a very interesting uh, market opportunity, investment opportunity. Like, we see this growing, it's a growing trend. So, especially like the, the milk industry is suffering the first disruption of the plant based alternatives, but, but it's going all over the market. And today, most of the nut, uh, the uh, alternative milks that we have, they are based on almond, and this almond production is coming from California. And we know this is stressing the water resources of the state, and this is going to collapse. No, this is like obvious. Uh, so now there's kind of a nut race uh, going on around the world uh, because uh, uh, we don't have enough supply to supply the market uh, in terms of uh, quality nuts. And we don't have to stick to almonds. We can do any types of nuts. And there are so many of them. Uh, of course, like going for Brazil nut is going to be very long term, very complicated. But then, like for instance, in our project, we're we're exploring baru nut, which is a native species from Cerrado, uh, very uh, like not well uh, known in the market, but with great superfood elements to it, where we can make oil, we can make different things out of it. We have the caju nut coming from Brazil, which is a really interesting species. And I really believe the future of the diet for humanity is eating more things that grow on trees. Uh, I don't have anything against annual crops, but we have to get over this idea that we plant, we, we harvest, we plant again, we harvest, uh, we have to shift towards uh, more perennial type of crops. So that's the, the, the main takeaway for me. Uh, very interesting. Um, I, I think 
Can you speak a little bit? I see some questions in the uh, coming in. Can you speak to your issue? Where do you, how are you dealing with biodiversity, native species versus um, working with um, crops, you know, uh, sourced from other, other parts of the world? Or how do you manage issues around biodiversity and native crops? Yeah, for me, like everything I do, I look at biodiversity. I don't like to have carbon as the main ecosystem service. Uh, so like I'm trying to have a combined biodiversity uh, component to the projects I do. Uh, so everything has to be diverse. And then you have the challenge of the supply chain because we're, we're going to start producing this farm many crops. And then the only supply chain we're tapped in right now is cattle. So then how can we, can we, 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 we tap our products to other supply chains? And all the pro, uh, agroforestry projects that I'm invested in uh, or exposed to or involved through other investments I do in Brazil, you have always the same issue. There's always like one supply chain built and then you have a lot of other things around it. Uh, but biodiversity is the main component. Uh, like I'm, I really believe on the, on the, on, in the future, we're gonna be able to allow farmers to receive money for the ecosystem services they're generating or the natural capital they're generating. And this is going to go beyond carbon. So it's all about measuring biodiversity as a whole. So that's Terrific. Important. Thank you. You know, something you mentioned about nut crops and uh, this uh, pen up global and growing global demand, we're seeing a similar phenomenon in pine chemicals. So uh, Brazil happens to be a leader in sourcing pine resin from pine trees uh, sold to pine resin derivative sold to the world. And uh, that's certainly something that we're growing at Ajito Verde and in Mexico, we're seeing uh, pine resin prices at record highs right now. And as we move to a low carbon economy, um, we're also seeing huge market opportunities where pine chemicals are able to substitute um, hydrocarbons or basically petroleum products. Um, and I think there's sort of some very uh, fair analogy to where we're sourcing the future of food and the future of protein uh, from nuts and other uh, plant plant based sources. Uh, when we look at these opportunities, I I'm really I want to turn Alan. Uh, I'm just very impressed as as uh, Morova uh, looks at this this shift in the market. Uh, I feel like every month Morova is launching a new uh, natural capital based solution fund. And it seems uh, something's changed. And um, I'm, I'm certainly at Hito Verde. We're working very closely with Morova's Land Degradation Neutrality Fund. But here you're launching an Amazon fund. And um, I'm wondering if you can speak to that. What's changing the market that we're just seeing um, new opportunities for scalable investments um, in the region? Uh, thanks, Sean. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really it really connects from uh, what you just said. I mean, I think anything made from petroleum can be made from from plants. Basically, I think uh, that's the next uh, uh, big uh, revolution. Uh, we see we see a lot of shifts, like was mentioned here on on food diets. Um, Brazil, it's one of the countries that 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 really. If you see all the all the research uh, and polls that people are really concerned about health eating, uh, food and beverage, uh, organic food, so this is really taking uh, momentum here, and we believe that that's that's a lot of space to to grow uh, in scale. And I think uh, we we I mean the name of the fund it's Amazon Biodiversity Fund. So we, uh, like Fernando said, we really uh biodiversity is really key to us um but uh but again if if you if you talk about uh, uh investment instruments uh liquid markets it's still carbon i think plays a a, a key role here especially on our instrument so actually uh everything started uh, really uh, for us with uh, in investments uh, backed by carbon, uh, and we still we still do that. So, for example, if any of these enterprises uh, that's actually integrating um, consumer end products with, uh, let's say, suppliers, uh, all of uh, our two investees, for example, uh, they do supply, they, they source from communities and and co-ops, uh, besides of having their uh, their own production, and and really so it. If they would go to, let's say, to a bank to finance their 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 growth uh, strategy, uh, they would they would have to give as collateral, let's say, a real asset. Uh, usually, very common uh, here, let's say, uh, land, 
for example, or, uh, or real estate or anything like that. But we actually operate uh, using, for example, carbon as a, as a, as a collateral. So not necessarily as a, um, as a, as a revenue stream to us, but actually as a collateral for, uh, for an exit. I just realized I'm the only one who has to deal with a, a closed entity fund here now. <laughs> so I'm alone on this one. But anyway, it really, it really helps. Uh, and it's really key for us uh, in our investment thesis, um, uh, carbon. And, um, and, and besides everything uh, about carbon markets, I think the, uh, the simple as we get the structure the simple it is to close the, this investment. So either, okay, so if, if you're not comfortable uh, dealing with carbon uh, as a stream of revenue, okay, so let's let's have a, a separate account in the treasury where you can uh, set aside the volume of carbon so you can have a, a collateral for, for the instrument. So these are the shifts I, uh, I, I see, and I think there is a, I, I think there's a great space to to work, and I mean, in nature-based solutions uh, with uh, with land tenure, it's really, it's really, it's really key for 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 solutions on on climate. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, turn to Johnny a little bit on the the opportunities, and especially as we're I feel we're at a precipice of attracting scalable institutional investment into nature-based solutions, and I'm just curious, do you think that's true from your perspective? What do you see as the opportunity for, for scalable investment uh, in nature-based solutions in Latin America from where you sit? Yeah, thanks, Sean. I mean, I'm not sure we're at the precipice yet. I mean, I have to say we we need larger portfolios of, of uh, assets to be there still. Um, so it's happening. Uh, still, it's let's be honest, it's, it's hard fundraising in this space for good reason. Um, I must be honest, you know, Latin America, you uh you're asking a good question i mean for me if we look at latam and not just brazil though i i am you know brazil is our main focus um, but also colombia and other countries we do see uh strong on you have to find them because there's a mix but strong entrepreneurs strong businesses who are and projects that are truly scalable so you know for us even as and green <clears throat> we're looking at <clears throat> sort of larger ticket sizes uh, and institutional investors even more so. I really think in LATAM, more than many other parts of the world, you can really scale projects. I mean, <clears throat> I think Miguel twice now mentioned 50 million hectares of degraded land. I mean, that's a significant opportunity in Brazil alone. 50 million hectares. I live in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is 4 million hectares, the whole country. Um, so there really is that level of opportunity, in my view, in LATAM. Uh, in Colombia, we're looking at a, at a project uh, in the Orinoquia. Again, biodiversity is key. So the how how you grow is key, but it's nearly a blank canvas. You can look at how do we build a whole sector here sustainably and at scale. So yes, I think you know LATAM is a very interesting. Uh, they're, they're re there's number one fantastic entrepreneurs and businesses, and then there's real scalability potential. A lot of the supply chains we've looked at are linked to the global market, which is also helpful for an international investor. You know we are at the end of the day a US dollar fund. Um, it's helpful if you know a lot of these these assets have that connection so we found that also i'm, I'm comparing now a little bit to um some other parts of the world where that's more tricky so for us that's i mean i think there's significant capital that can that can be deployed and you have to look at i mean let's take brazil for a second brazil is competing with the united states uh, and other countries of same of similar sort of developed market status when it comes to a lot of these agricultural supply chains um, it is, you know, it needs to be, you need to remember uh, the, the scale of this country and, and the agricultural um, sector. So they, there's a lot of professionalization there that is, that is actually lacking in some other parts of the world. Um, and I think we, we see that spin off uh, towards other countries as well. I'm starting to see that, for example, in Colombia. Um, and I think, you know, Chile, Uruguay, et cetera, Argentina, uh, for sure as well. So I, I guess that's my message. I mean, I think, I think we've still got some way as a, as a, as a fund manager Institutional investors are still struggling a little bit um, to invest in nature-based solutions, whether it's in LATAM or anywhere else. I mean, you know, Morova is an established fund manager, but they would, they still struggle to raise money for um, the fund Alan is working on, just because it's difficult for people to get their head around. But I do so. I do think people like us need to build the scale that'll bring them along. Um, but it's very, very much possible in LATAM, in my view. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I realize we only have uh, about five more minutes, and there's a lot of very interesting questions 
through the chat. Uh, we might not be able to get to all of them. So I do encourage people in the audience to reach out to the panelists on the platform. I think that there might be able to get some more specific responses to some of the questions that are out there. Uh, to building on Johnny's question, I've been uh, deploying capital in Latin America myself for 30 years, and I'm very excited about the infrastructure that's being built. You know, clear rule of law, some tax, adequate uh, tax structures, but the, the risk mitigation measures, first loss guarantees, um, the role of government, smart subsidies that can help uh, build, you know, early industries that we're talking about, nature-based solutions, sustainably sourced, uh, agriculture and forestry products. Um, and again, with that, I want to turn to Twitter some around or wrap up questions where I wanted to um, really ask each panelist if they had any um, uh, offer for uh, to offer to the audience, whether you have an offer, a request or an invitation uh, that you would like from um, uh, the people joining us uh, listening in on this panel today. And if I might be so bold, I might start uh, just briefly at Ajito Verde. Uh, we're now, you know, um, we're growing 12,000 hectares with 4,000 hectares under management, and we're in a capital raise. We've secured $25 million toward our $15 million goal, and we're certainly excited to look at um, uh, growing our capital partners to join institutions like the Inter-American Bank and uh, the pine chemical industry that have been um, important investors in our work. I welcome hearing from people uh, deploying regenerative strategies in building their businesses that we're constantly building on, and certainly um, excited to hear about exploration of uh, for capital partners. People might want to learn more about Ajito Verde. And with that, if I, if I could turn to Miguel, if there's any invitation or request. Yeah, again, uh, if anyone is interested in investing in Brazil, what we can offer right now is a lot of experience based on what we have been learning through the Verena project. We have a lot of information, a lot of data. They are all public information and we'll be more than happy to help uh, build this uh, pipeline of projects to design whatever the model to help to look for uh, uh, finance. So this is a good part of WRI, right? We can, we want to see this happening. We want to see the, the increasing scale so we can, we have, Everything we do is, is for it's public, right? It's really for the good of the society. So again, we are we are there, ready to share everything we know and also to discover things that we don't know. So again, count on us uh, at any time. And again, there's a huge opportunity, and and we have a very short time to make this happen. Now we think about more in terms of climate change. There's a need to restore and reforest many many millions of hectares. If we don't move very fast, we will fail altogether. Uh, and leaving, a, a, let's say, a bad legacy to the next generation. So I think we need to figure out how to do better and bigger in terms of a natural climate solution or nature-based solution. Thank you very much for Fantastic. the opportunity. Thank Brazil, you. Brazil, Brazil is clearly one of the, the most important emerging markets globally. And I really appreciate Miguel as our go-to person representing a network of organizations to really help investors uh, Deploy, deploy capital, meeting uh, both financial and social environmental objectives. Fernando, any invitations or requests for our audience? Yeah, I think my big request is like uh, for those, especially family offices who can invest a little bit earlier stage, uh, we need to create pipeline for all these guys in this panel. <laughs> so, so for all the funds, you know, so like, and Green, for instance, uh, they have a grant line for early stage projects. This is great. Uh, but we really need to invest also in the funds where like accelerator programs in the Amazon. I'm helping Idesan, which is an organization in the Amazon, to start a new one called Amas. And this feeds pipeline for all these larger funds. This is something we have to do. And also about the cattle, I see some questions going that way. And I, I, I've been asked and aggressively asked many times about my colleagues, impact investors, especially the European vegan ones, uh, why the hell I'm doing cattle and why can I, how can I call cattle uh, sustainable? Uh, but the invitation I make is really to dive deep into the subject because the reality today is that cattle is there, is a major source of deforestation. I would love people to turn vegan if they can. And I would love to see a, a world in 10 years that eats less meat. But the reality today, we have to do something with the cattle. So that's why we call it cattle a sustainable investment. <laughs> okay. So that's okay. what we I know we're, sh we're short on time. And, uh, but I do really, this is just a rich conversation. Johnny, could um, we hear from I'll, you? Yeah, I'll be short. Um, uh, I'll, I'll be Dutch in the sense that very happy to hear from anybody who you know thinks they're connected to our thesis. Uh, we'll be, we'll always respond. We'll be, uh, 
as straightforward as we can in our response. We're looking, uh, I think Fernando hit the nail on the head there on two points I would have raised on the cattle one, but also on the very happy to see projects which are, think they're, you know, they're, they're getting somewhere and they're interested to know whether it will be a fit with us. Uh, we can, we can, we can take a look. So. Terrific. Uh, Thank you. Alan. Yes, I'll also be very quick here. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would actually invite on, uh, on the two um, streams, so up, up and down stream. So if you're an institutional investor and want to know us uh, better, uh, our fund, uh, please uh, uh, get in touch uh, with me. But also, uh, like Fernando mentioned, uh, if you are also an entrepreneur, if you are an accelerator, uh, we also, uh, we are very hands-on fund. So we are, we are always active looking for to source pipeline of deals. This is very important to us because it's not, it's not only hard to, you know, to raise capital, but, uh, but also deploy capital, especially uh, in the Amazon. It's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not so uh, straightforward. And just the last one, I think there was a question on, on, on FX. Uh, our fund is uh, denominated in Brazilian high, so no, no FX uh, risk on that one. Thank you. Terrific. I know this uh, panel certainly leaves me wanting more information, uh, but really what a, what a fabulous uh, round of experience we're hearing from. Uh, for me as a overarching wrap up, this is an exciting time for the region for investing in nature-based solutions. We're clearly in a building phase of building the sector. Um, here we have builders. I think the investment opportunities often require uh, that we're not just investing, but building. And if we're not a fund that can be a builder, we need to align ourselves with builders, analogous to the work that Miguel is doing with World Resources Institute, Fernando's doing on the ground. I want to thank you all for um, uh, joining us for this really uh, valuable panel on investing in nature-based solutions in Latin America and forestry regenerative agriculture. Um, it's been a pleasure. Sean Paul with the Hito Verde. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much.